Hey there, I'm Sabrina, and I have an unbelievable story to share with you. My husband, Austin, and I met five years ago at a charity event. It was love at first sight, and we soon embarked on a beautiful journey together. We got married two years later and worked tirelessly to ensure a comfortable life for ourselves. Our long work hours never prevented us from finding time for each other because we cherished every moment we spent together. However, fate dealt me a harsh blow. One night, I came home feeling really sick. My body was weak, and I couldn't think straight. At first, I thought it was just a bad flu, something that would go away with some rest and medicine. As the days passed, things got worse instead of better. Breathing became really hard, like there was something heavy on my chest. I tried my best to take deep breaths, but it felt like I was suffocating. It was so scary being all by myself at home with nobody to help me right away. I managed to call Austin, even though my hands shook. Baby, it's me. I need you to listen, please. I don't know what's happening, but I'm really scared. I'm not feeling very well. Darling, what's going on? I, I can't breathe. I feel so weak and so alone. Darling, I need you to stay calm. I'm on my way. Okay, just lie down and try to take slow breaths. You're strong, and I believe in you. Help is coming. I'm trying, but it's getting harder. I don't know if I can hold on much longer. Please hurry. You're not alone. I'm doing everything I can to get there quickly. You need to stay strong for me. Take slow breaths and try to relax. Help is on its way, I promise, baby. I love you. Please don't let me go. I don't want to leave you. My darling, don't talk like that. You're going to be okay. Just keep holding on. I love you too, and I need you here with me. We'll get through this together, I promise. Just keep fighting. Austin didn't waste any time. He asked his friend to call for an ambulance and rushed to get help. I just hoped they would arrive in time because every breath I took felt like it could be my last. It felt like time was slipping away and I didn't know what was going to happen to me. Finally, after what felt like forever, I heard banging on my door. I was so weak that I could barely move, but I knew help had come. I let myself drift into darkness hoping that the doctors and nurses would be able to save me. It was such a scary moment, lying there not knowing if I would survive. When I regained consciousness, I found myself in a hospital room surrounded by white walls and the beeping of machines. To my relief, Austin was there, his eyes bloodshot from crying. Austin, I'm so glad you're here. What happened? What did the doctor say? Of course, my love. I'll always be here. The doctors are still doing tests to figure out what's wrong. They gave you medicine to help with the fever for now, but they need more time to find out the exact problem. I feel so scared. I don't know how much longer I can handle this. I know that you're scared, love, but we have to stay strong and patient. The doctors are doing everything they can to figure out what's happening. We need to trust them in their knowledge. It's just not knowing that's really hard. I don't want this to be life-threatening. I just want to be healthy again. I want that too, my love. Remember, we're in this together. No matter what the doctors find, we'll face it together. I'll be right here supporting you through it all. Thank you, baby. Days passed and dread and hopelessness engulfed me. Austin was not allowed to be in the same room as me as they were unsure of my condition. Nevertheless, he faithfully called me every morning and evening, diligently checking up on me. But the fear of the unknown weighed heavily on my heart, and I felt a sense of isolation. Finally, on the fourth day, the doctor approached me with a diagnosis. Doctor, please tell me what's wrong with me. Did you find out what it is? So, the test results have come back, and I have a diagnosis for you. It appears that you have contracted a rare form of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis? Does that mean I'm going to die? No, Sabrina. Please try to stay calm. We caught it at the right moment, and there is a cure for it. With the right medication, we can treat it successfully. Oh, thank goodness. So can I be cured? 
Yes, after three weeks of taking the medication, you will no longer be contagious. However, you will need to continue taking the medication for the next nine months to completely get rid of the bacteria. That's a relief to hear. Thank you, doctor. I'm so glad we caught it in time. But what about my husband? Is he at risk? We took precautions. Austin has been quarantined as a preventive measure, and we tested him for TB. Fortunately, his results came back negative. You can rest assured that he is not at risk. Thank you, doctor. I'm so grateful that Austin is safe. We'll get through this together. After my discharge from the hospital, I returned home feeling weak and vulnerable. The financial burden of the hospital bills and the cost of medications weighed heavily on Austin. He worked long hours to ensure we could make ends meet, leaving me in need of someone to take care of me during my recovery. It was then that Austin suggested his mother, Harriet, as a potential caregiver. Baby, I get why you want your mum to help, but I'm not sure it's a good idea. We've always had problems and I'm worried it could make things worse for both of us. I know, darling, I get that you're worried, but she's our only family and I trust her to take care of you. Believe me, it would make me feel better if someone I trust is looking out for you. I know, but Harriet and I get along like fire and ice. One of her being here just adds more stress to everything. I don't think either of us will have the energy to deal with her shenanigans. Well, I know our history with my mom hasn't been great, but she's still my mom, and I believe in giving her a chance. It would mean a lot to me if you could try to let her help us during this time. Fine, baby. I know family is important to you. I'll do my best to put aside my worries and give Harriet a chance. We'll figure it out together, I suppose. The mere thought of depending on Harriet sent a wave of worry through me. Our relationship had always been strained, like two opposing magnets that repelled each other. Our personalities clashed and our differences seemed irreconcilable. I often felt judged and unsupported in her presence, as if my choices and opinions were constantly under scrutiny. Harriet's presence had a way of making me feel small and insignificant. Her remarks and comments were often laced with disapproval, leaving me doubting my worth. It seemed like no matter what I did, I could never meet her expectations or gain her acceptance. Our interactions were filled with tension and a constant undercurrent of unease. But at that moment, when I needed help the most, I felt trapped. I had no other family to turn to for support. My parents had passed away and I had no siblings. The only other person who could have come to my aid was my best friend, Chelsea. I didn't want to burden her with my troubles, so with a heavy heart, I reluctantly agreed to let Harriet take care of me. I knew that accepting her help came with its own set of challenges. It meant putting aside our differences and finding a way to coexist for the sake of my recovery. It meant swallowing my pride and opening myself up to the possibility of disappointments once again. But I had no other choice. I needed someone to be there for me, even if it was someone as challenging as Harriet. Little did I know that the path ahead would be filled with frustration and disappointment. Harriet's assistance turned out to be far from what I had hoped for. Instead of providing the care and support I desperately needed, she seemed disinterested and negligent. I found myself navigating my recovery largely on my own, struggling to perform simple tasks while feeling utterly alone. Each day became a battle against my weakened body and the emotional toll of feeling abandoned by the person who was supposed to take care of me. But I kept my silence, not wanting to burden Austin further with the added stress of our strained relationship. It was a lonely and disheartening time as I longed for compassion and understanding that seemed beyond Harriet's reach. One day I needed help getting to the bathroom. I was feeling particularly weak and wasn't able to do much by myself. I called out to Harriet to help me, but instead I was met with silence. Growing frustrated and desperate, I decided to take matters into my own hands. With the support of various things in my room, I made it to the bathroom. Once I was done, I managed to get out and was greeted by Harriet. At that moment, I felt a surge of anger course through me. Why are you in my room? 
I already took care of the problem myself. I never wanted to take care of you in the first place. I'm sick and tired of having to be your caretaker when you're perfectly capable of doing it yourself. What do you mean by capable? Don't you see how much I'm suffering? Suffering? You don't know the meaning of suffering. I've had enough of this. I'm packing my bags and leaving. I felt my heart break at that moment. Why was she being so cruel to me? Couldn't she see how much I was suffering? I couldn't bring myself to say anything because I was still reeling from the shock of her words. I tried to protest, but my legs gave out from under me. She just looked at me with disdain instead of offering aid. Harriet abandoned me, leaving me there. I lay on the cold, hard floor, sobbing uncontrollably, my heart shattered. Hours later, I awoke to Austin's frantic shaking. My body was trembling, and my temperature soared. Austin rushed to get me back onto the bed, administering my medications with a mix of concern and anger. Where is my mother, darling? What happened? I, I don't know how to say this, but she left. I called her to help me get to the bathroom for half an hour before I finally dealt with it myself. Then, when I was done, she came into my room and said such cruel things to me. She told me. She never wanted to take care of me and said she was done. I can't believe she would do that. I'm so sorry, my darling. I can't believe my mother would treat you this way. It's not fair to you, especially after everything you've been through. You don't have to apologize for anything, my dear. I just, I can't understand why she would be so cruel. I'm sorry for burdening you with this. My love, you are never a burden to me. I love you and I hate to see you hurt. I'll talk to my mother and make sure she knows how unacceptable her behavior was. You deserve better and I promise to stand by you through it all. Thank you, baby. In a desperate attempt to find help, Austin called my best friend, Chelsea, who agreed without hesitation to care for me for the next week. With Chelsea by my side, my recovery progressed smoothly. Finally, I regained my health and decided it was time to address Harriet's situation. Just as I resumed my job, Austin called me with startling news. His mother, Harriet, had been involved in a car accident, breaking both her legs and an arm. I asked Austin what we were going to do, and he admitted he didn't know. Harriet lived alone, and there was no one else to care for her. At that moment, a decision crystallized in my mind. I would be the one to take care of Harriet. When I arrived at the hospital to retrieve her, she glared at me, asking when Austin would come to look after her. I smiled serenely, explaining that I would be her caretaker since Austin was too overwhelmed with work. Harriet's shock was evident as she realized the tables had turned. As I cared for Harriet, I took it upon myself to ensure her life was just a little more inconvenient, a gentle reminder of the pain she had inflicted upon me. These inconveniences were minor but infuriating. For example, knowing how picky Harriet was with her food, I would sometimes cook her meals that I knew she hated or oversalt her food a little. Whenever she settled down to watch her favorite TV show, I would misplace the remote causing her to call me for help. I would conveniently be busy doing a chore at that moment. Sometimes I would adjust the volume of the TV slightly, forcing her to strain her ears or reach for the remote she had finally found. In the mornings when she craved a steaming cup of coffee, I would accidentally use her favorite mug and leave it unwashed, making her settle for a different cup or spend time cleaning her treasured mug. These small disruptions might seem trivial, but they served as a reminder that actions have consequences and thoughtlessness can lead to inconvenience. I also made sure that the items she needed were just slightly out of reach. If she desired a book from the shelf, I would place it a little higher, prompting her to stretch or ask for assistance. It was a subtle way of reminding her that dependence on others requires humility and gratitude. While these actions may have seemed petty, they were a means for me to regain a sense of power and control. They allowed me to assert myself and highlight the importance of compassion and understanding in our interactions. 
Harriet began to experience firsthand the frustration of being treated with the same disregard she had shown me. She had subjected me to those inconveniences during my illness, and perhaps she began to understand the consequences of her behavior. Through these subtle inconveniences, I hoped to create an environment where Harriet could reflect on her actions and recognize the value of empathy. I wanted her to realize that it is our responsibility to treat others with kindness, especially when they are vulnerable or in need. As the weeks turned into months, Harriet's physical injuries began to heal, but something unexpected happened. Instead of showing any growth or empathy, she began to display entitlement and dissatisfaction with the care I provided. She called Austin, complaining that I wasn't taking good care of her. Concerned by his mother's complaints, Austin came over that night to ask her what was going on. Mom, I heard you've been complaining about Sabrina not taking good care of you. What's going on? Austin, let me tell you she's been doing a terrible job. I can't believe I have to rely on her. She's been neglectful. Well, I understand you're frustrated, but let's not forget how you treated Sabrina when she needed you. She stepped up to care for you despite our differences. She showed compassion and support even though it wasn't easy for her. Well, she should have done better. I don't see why I have to be grateful for her help. Well, you should have done better for her too. With the way you treated her, I'm surprised she didn't cause you any harm. A little neglect from her is better than her abandoning you, isn't it? I didn't realize. It's time to acknowledge Sabrina's efforts and be grateful for what she did for you. If you're going to be disrespectful and unappreciative, then maybe you should find help on your own, just like you made us do for Sabrina. With that, Harriet scoffed and turned her head away, throwing a tantrum like a child. While Austin might have entertained her demands earlier, he was now fed up. He grabbed my hand and we walked out, driving back home. Though I didn't expect Austin to stand up for me, I was beyond grateful that he did. It felt good to have the man I love reciprocate his love for me in such an obvious manner. In the days that followed, Harriet's absence became palpable. She didn't reach out to us and we didn't attempt to contact her. We wanted to give her space to reflect on her actions and determine if she was truly ready to change. Through chance encounter with one of Harriet's neighbors, Austin learned that she had hired someone to assist her. However, it became apparent that the hired help was treating her in the same dismissive and neglectful manner that Harriet had treated me. Austin and I learned of this with a mix of disappointment and understanding. We had hoped that our experiences would open Harriet's eyes to the importance of compassion and empathy, but it became evident that true transformation is a personal journey that cannot be forced upon someone. In the end, we made the conscious decision not to intervene. Our focus shifted toward nurturing our relationship and building a life filled with love, understanding, and support. We chose to create a space where forgiveness and growth could thrive rather than dwell on the past or engage in further confrontations. As the days turned into months, Harriet became a distant memory. The wounds she had inflicted upon us slowly faded, replaced by the joy and fulfillment we found in our renewed bond. Life presented us with new opportunities, and we embraced them wholeheartedly.